All right, let's go check out what equipment we're going to need for river running. We're at the Nanahale Outdoor Center and the Outfitters store. All the goods are inside. Come check it out. Okay, you need to know what makes a good river running kayak. Rule number one is if your objective is to get down the river right side up, comfortable, in control, and gain confidence in kayaking, you need a boat that's going to make that as easy as possible. Now the funny thing is uh, a boat that's really good for one person, a great river runner for one person, might not be a great river runner for another person. And the primary factors that determine a great river running boat are number one, the boat's design, and number two, the size and the shape of the person in that boat. So let's go through number one, the design. The design of a river running boat. Your objective is extremely easy to roll. Now I designed a boat called the Fun Series and the objective was to maximize uh, the river running ability of this boat. So rolling ability is number one. In order for a boat to be easy to roll, the back band needs to be low enough on your body that allows you to do a full hip snap and lean back. Number two, you need to have a lot of flare in the sidewalls so that when you roll up, it gets to a certain point, it wants to finish the roll and get you back right side up. That flare also keeps you from tipping over. It gives you secondary stability, which is a key factor in a river running boat. Next, you need a bow and stern that stay out of the water as much as possible. That means you need to have enough rocker in the boat so when you're paddling, your bow isn't purling all the time. Lastly, you need to make sure that your boat is stable enough. It needs to be wide enough for your body. If the boat's too narrow or too small, you're going to be tippy in the boat. If it's too wide, it's going to be hard to roll. So basically what you want is a boat that's the right size for you. So size is key. There is actually one other factor. If your boat has edges on it at all, they need to be high enough out of the water that you're not catching your edge down the river. You want some space between the water and that edge. As long as you have some space, the boat's not going to be edgy. You can have nice sharp edges on a kayak and they won't be a negative factor, they'll be a positive factor as long as the water is far enough below the edges. Now let's go with a couple people here. Here I've got a couple helpers, my daughter Emily and Lauren. Um, both of these girls can fit in the fun one and a half, for example. Um, Emily, you want to jump in, please? Emily can fit in this kayak. It's called the fun one and a half. So she can fit in it comfortably. She can sit in the boat. This boat is designed to be easy to roll, non-edgy, an ultimate river runner. However, Emily's a little bit too heavy for this boat. When Emily's in this boat, the water is all the way up to the edge. If the water is all the way up to the edge or even slightly over, these edges are in play at all times, which means every time a current hits her from the side, it's going to try to flip her. Now go ahead and jump out, Em. Now Emily could play boat this boat really well. She could do all kinds of tricks in it. You want to jump in, Lauren? Now Lauren is quite a bit smaller. Lauren's on the 80 pounds. So she's in the same boat now. Now all of a sudden Lauren's in the exact same boat. Now the water line is down here. This boat is an awesome, in fact it is the number one best river runner that this nine-year-old girl could possibly get in at her size and weight. Now what is the difference? Well Emily is big enough that she can really throw the boat around, it's a great play boat for her. Uh, where Lauren isn't going to be able to flat water cartwheel the boat necessarily or very easy. However, because she's the right size for the boat, even a little bit on the light size, it's light side for her, it's going to make the ultimate river runner for her. Now check this out. Lauren currently owns this boat over here. This is the next size down, the fun one. You want to jump in that, Lauren? So this is the boat that Lauren currently paddles. It's called the fun one. Now this is a full size down from the fun one and a half, right? Well, Lauren can full play boat this. She's, she can paddle forward and go into a bow stall, that type of thing. She's 80 pounds. She's right at what is considered to be the top level for the weight of this boat. So the river running ability of the fun one for her is starting to get, is starting to get lower. The play boating ability is, is increasing. So when you're deciding what kind of kayak to get, it's very key that you look at the chart and you make sure that you're not at the top end on the weight of, for that particular boat if you're looking for the easiest river running boat. As we get into the larger categories of boats, there's, um, boats have been designed for a lot of different sizes. There haven't been a whole lot of boats designed for the 240 plus category. So if you're over 240 pounds, you need to be looking at the charts and determine what boats go to the highest uh, weight category. Um, 
this is an example of a super fun and I show it between uh, 190 and 250 as the category. However, um, Dan at 260, does that mean this boat isn't going to work for him? Not at all. It's going to be, he's, his water line is going to be higher on the edges and it's going to be more edgy than Nathan here at 220. But the objective is to get the, the best possible boat for your weight. And unfortunately, there aren't a whole lot of boats designed for over 250, so you need to get the biggest one you can. Um, the example in the fun series is the super fun. There's also a few creek boats out there and river running creek boats that fit the bill as well. You've got a great river running boat. Your next, your next key is going to be getting it outfitted properly. You need to have contact with your body in all the right places. Your hips, your knees, and your feet. You need to have a proper back band in place. Let's start with the hips. Hip pads go in the boat. The objective is to take up that extra room in your rear end so that your rear end doesn't slide back and forth. If you go to lean to the side, your butt doesn't slide to the side. It also makes it a lot easier to roll when you're doing the hip snap. Now, you can adjust the hip pads up and down. That really helps tighten it. If you want to tighten your hip pads, you move it down and the thick part goes further down on your rear end. If you um, want to loosen it up, you simply raise it up or rotate it. There's also often, for really small hip people, there's often shims you can put on to tighten the thing up as well. So the hip pads go in, key number one. You should feel like there's no extra room side to side, but it shouldn't be squeezing. Next thing is your back band. Your back band should be adjustable and it should support your back when you're sitting neutral. When you lean forward, the back band should move away from your back slightly. When you lean back, you should feel a little bit more pressure. Hey Nathan, you want to jump in please? Nathan's getting in the boat here. All right, so Nathan, I want you to tighten your back band. Okay, good. Now, let's see where you are. Sit up straight, good posture. Okay, I can put my hand between the back band and his back. Let's tighten it a little bit more. Okay, perfect. All right, now lean forward. A little more, there you go. The pressure comes off his back, lean back. All right, good. Now next thing is let's make sure um, that our knees are properly outfitted. Now with this boat, the, the, the knee brace is designed right in the kayak. Now his legs, if you look, aren't even touching. Now the reason his legs aren't touching aren't because the, the knee braces aren't tight. It's because his feet have too much room. So if his feet have too much room, his leg pushes forward. We need to bring his legs back by giving him some foot um, pressure, which that will hold his knees to the top. So Nathan, um, there's a pump bulb in here. If you can pump that up. In this boat, it's a thing called the Happy Feet, which is an adjustable foot brace. He's pumping up the air bladder, which will move his, his airbag all the way back until it keeps pushing his feet back and back. And that'll hold his knees against the top. All right, now look. Just relax, Nathan. Move your arm here. Now notice he's got contact in his leg from here all the way up to his knee, and his knee is also contacting the outside of the boat. That allows him to have really good control. He can lift the knee. If he drops an edge, his knee doesn't fall to the side. And when he goes to roll, he's got great contact and it's going to be comfortable. He's not going to be falling out of the boat. So we've got foot contact, leg contact, back, and hips. So now his great river running boat is perfectly outfitted and he's ready to run the river. Cool. Thanks. Now, when choosing a helmet, of course, your objective for the helmet is that it is a safety piece. So the helmet's what's going to protect you and insulate you between the rocks and your head. There's three basic things you want to look at with a helmet. Number one is going to be the fit. So uh, I've got Nathan here. We're going to use his head as our fit. Just see if you can stick that on. Uh, that's good. If you notice that uh, this particular helmet is riding really high in Nathan's head. Now, Maybe it can be adjusted. This particular helmet has these little red flames in here. Can you rip those out real quick? This helmet may or may not fit his head. We need to determine that. Go ahead and put that on, see if that works. All right, that's better. It, it's, that's better. It's snug. It doesn't move around. It, I'd say it still looks a little bit high on his head. All right. Now this helmet has better coverage around the ears, which can be an advantage, 
But if you look, it wobbles around in his head. It's too big. Now, why is that bad? He hits one hit, his helmet goes back and exposes his forehead. Your objective in choosing a helmet is to make sure you have one that doesn't wobble around in your head too much. So that helmet is going to be too big. Now, yes, the helmet can be um, adjusted. You can glue foam in. You can do several things to try to make the helmet fit. All right. So there, we have another snug fit. This is another plastic shelled helmet. It's a snug fit. Looks like it's got good coverage. This helmet would do the trick for him as well. He might not like the color. So the number three thing, of course, about the uh, helmet that most people look at this is like the wearing a hat, so they want to have a little bit of the cool factor going. So yeah, you can get some cool factor in a helmet, but you never sacrifice safety for the cool factor. There's generally some kind of adjustment factor for the helmet. So you need to make sure um, that there's usually a front strap and a back strap. You need to make sure both straps are tight. If the front strap is loose, the helmet's going to want to rock back. If the back strap is loose, the helmet's going to want to rock forward. So the objective is to have both of them have equal pressure to hold the helmet centered on your head. There's a lot of good helmets out there. Um, they come in all different price categories. The next thing we're going to talk about is your kayak paddle. A paddle is not only a tool that you're going to use to maneuver the boat around, it's a tool you're going to use to keep yourself right side up or if you tip over to roll yourself back up. The key to a paddle is that it has enough length and leverage that allows you to have long enough outriggers out there, that's for your bracing, that keeps you right side up, and enough leverage to help you with your roll. If you're learning river running, you don't want to go with a really short paddle simply because a short paddle is going to put you in a position where you're not going to have enough leverage to stay right side up and you're not going to have enough blade out there, enough paddle out there to allow you to roll up easily. So let's figure out what is the right size for you. Here we have Lauren holding two paddles. Um, Lauren, what I want you to do is, uh, let's take the short one, put it on your head, hold it towards the outside, okay, put it right on your head there. Notice that Lauren's elbows are less than a 90 degree angle and she doesn't have any space to move out to the, to the blades anymore. She's all the way out to the end of the paddle. Now put the paddle on the ground, hold the, put your hand on the top. Lauren can reach the top of the paddle way too easy. She, her arm is bent, she doesn't have to reach for it. Now take this paddle, reach the top, your hand to the top. Lauren has to do a full reach, she can just hold her, pat, her hands to the top. Generally speaking, that's a good way to start. If you have to reach your hands all the way up in order to hold the paddle, you've got a good size. Now, um, you're going to find that people are going to recommend a paddle that's shorter than you might, that you might want to use. For example, I'm 5'6", I go into a store, somebody's going to recommend between 190 and 196 centimeter paddle. I'm going to recommend that you go as high as 200 centimeters. For, and anybody who is 5'6 or taller, my recommendation is you don't buy anything shorter than 199 centimeters, especially if you're learning to paddle and you're a river runner. Remember, why is that? Because you want to stay right side up, you want to be able to roll, and you don't want to have any trouble reaching the water with your paddle. So Lauren, put this one on your head. Hold the right spot. All right, that's the right spot. Now watch, if Lauren were to brace, she reaches out, she's got a lot of paddle out there, she's got a lot of leverage, she can stay right side up. With a little paddle, she can't. All right, cool. Next, there's the question of, do you use a bent shaft or a straight shaft? Well, the bottom line is both work extremely well. You can get away with, with either one. There are some advantages to a bent shaft that I should explain, and people wonder, well, what's the deal with the bent shaft? Well, number one, with, with the shaft being bent, when you reach forward with the paddle, your wrist is in a more natural position. If you reach forward with the, without the bent shaft, it cocks your wrist back. Some people get tendonitis in the wrist and elbows if they paddle without a bent shaft. Um, another thing to be, just to look at is the blade shape. A lot of blades have a big rib on the back. And what a rib does, like this one here, what a rib does, it just provides water resistance. It makes it more difficult to do things, um, do your strokes, for example, to feather the paddle through the water, whether it be during a roll or just doing your strokes. Now, um, the benefit of a paddle with a rib on the back is they're cheaper to manufacture, so in the shop, you can get that same paddle at a cheaper price. If you can, go with a paddle without a rib. If you can't afford it, um, go with one that's the right size. And a rib is, is fine, it's just not as good. 
All right, our next piece of equipment is called a life jacket or a personal flotation device. Now, there's all kinds of life jackets that are made for, for whitewater kayaking. And some of the key elements for whitewater kayaking life jackets is full range of motion. Uh, the, the paddle jackets or the life jackets don't get in your way for your arms, for rolling, bracing, paddling. Um, the real key is that you just have the right size and you know how to stick it on and, and put it on safely. So um, just, I'm going to have Stephen right here. He's uh, putting on a says zip up Lotus design jacket. Um, he's zipping it up. Notice that he's putting the zipper in a little holder so it doesn't accidentally get unzipped. Next thing he wants you want to do is he's going to tighten down the straps. These straps tighten you under the rib cage. And the purpose of getting tightened under the rib cage, notice there's a bottom strap. He's going to buckle it here. He's, he's going to make sure those are tight enough. Now, what the whole purpose of those straps is not just to keep it from moving around, but if we were to lift them up, it's tightened under the rib cage. The life jacket won't come off, which is obviously key. If you end up swimming down the river, you don't want the life jacket riding up under your neck. You want it being held down properly. That is a safe, um, floating, properly mounted, properly um, put on life jacket. So a, a, a great life jacket does not work properly if you don't properly adjust it. So make sure when you get the thing on, you have it all tightened down, grab the straps and lift up. Make sure that you can feel it pull up on your rib cage and that it doesn't want to come off. Life jackets come in all sizes. So Dane here has got a, um, a one that's called the half pints for kids. It's the same deal. It only has two adjustment straps, but the same deal. It adjusts under the rib cage. So I can lift him up and the life jacket doesn't come off, which is, of course, key. The next piece of gear I want to talk about is a spray skirt. Now the whole idea behind the spray skirt is a spray skirt keeps the water out of your kayak. Simple as that. Now your objective should be to have a skirt that A keeps the water out of the kayak and they all do, it, do that to a different um, level of success. Number two, it should be easy enough to get on that it's not high stress getting it on. And most importantly, it's got to be easy enough to get off that you're comfortable you can get it off if you need to. There's two main kinds of skirts. There is one um, that has what we we'll call a rand on the back of the skirt. Um, this particular skirt has been around a really long time and is the most successful in keeping water out. The other kind of skirt that um, we have, and this we have holding it here, is John Mason. He's the owner and designer of these particular skirts, um, is the bungee skirt. Now, the bungee skirts are known to be a little easier to get on, a little easier to get off, but not as good at keeping the water out. Now, there's, um, there's other factors that go into a skirt, like uh, whether it's reinforced, whether they last a long time, um, and all that just determines what you're going to be paying for a skirt. But ultimately, um, my suggestion is always to get a skirt that's easy to get on for you, easy to get off, and keeps the water out. The Rand one is ideal, um, but you can get a bungee skirt for cheaper. Both work really well. The key, key factor is you don't go anywhere in, uh, with a skirt or a boat until you've tried the skirt on the kayak. Because every kayak is a little bit different. Now every one of the fun series, for example, has a different size cockpit. So this is what's called an extra wide keyhole. And this skirt, and this is one of our biggest cockpit rims. But if you notice, it fits on real easy. Notice that there's, there's no sag here, which means that the, the skirt deck is the right size. It's stretching the neoprene just slightly. What that does is when the waves hit on your boat, it doesn't push down, doesn't suck the water in. If you look, grab the, key, the uh, grab handle, should be able to pull it right off. Good to go. We've got the right skirt for the super fun here. All right, we have a very key element to safe river running. That is the shoes that you're wearing. Um, there's very few shoes that really work well inside a kayak and also work well outside of a kayak. Um, it's very tempting to think that the best shoes would be a set of river sandals. River sandals are awesome when you're out of the kayak. They're great for walking on the rocks. Uh, they're great for walking in the water. However, if you look at, at Stephen's feet here, river sandals have a lot of space around the feet. They take up a lot of extra room in the boat. They also tend to hook up on things in the boat and make getting in and out more difficult. And certain boats, as, as smaller boats, like river running play boats, they don't even fit in very good and they're uncomfortable when they're in the boat. 
So um, the best alternative is a set of booties. Now what Dane's wearing here is a, is a set of booties. And these booties not only are neoprene, which keep your, your uh, feet warm when you're in the boat, but they're also very low profile. They really wrap and they're basically the same size as his feet. They don't take up a lot of extra space. But most importantly is they've got soles on them. When you're river running, you're going to find yourself out scouting, walking around on the rocks, walking in the water. If you're in a, in a river that's along the road, you might find that there's glass in the river, which we hope we don't find, but there's cases like that. So bare feet is just unacceptable when you're river running. If you're barefoot in river running, you're not only endangering yourself, but you're endangering those around you because by not being able to react and get to somebody in need quickly, uh, you're putting them in danger as well. So my recommendation is 100% of the time you wear some sort of, of booties with a sole that you can run around in that fit well in your boat. We're standing here by the river. It's like a 70 degree day, just wearing shorts outside. But we're getting ready to go on the water, and that water's cold. So instead of dressing for the parking lot, I'm going to be dressing for the water temperature. I've got pants on, fleece. I'm getting ready to put a dry top on and even pants. And even though I can't hang out in the parking lot in all this gear, if I end up in that water, I'm going to be real happy I dressed the way I did. To dress for the water, we're going to want to wear some either polyester fleece or neoprene to insulate your body and then wear some waterproof fabric over that. What this accomplishes is the waterproof fabric keeps the water out and the insulating layer keeps that cold fabric away from your skin. Some of the different shells you're going to see are paddle jackets, which typically have a Velcro or a stretchy closure to keep most of the water out of your neck. But then you also can upgrade to a dry top, which will have these latex seals, which seal all of the water out of your neck and wrists. That's a lot warmer. Some other cold water gear you might want to consider are pogies to keep your hands warm in really cold water. These things Velcro onto your paddle, and then your hand goes in where you can hold your paddle securely but also take your hand right out if you need to. And then a skull cap will really keep your head warm. They may look funny, but they sure are warm. Some other accessories you should definitely consider are going to be some float bags and a throw bag. Nobody should really be on the river without a throw bag just in case that their buddy gets into trouble. This will allow you to drag them out from the center of the river and over to the bank where they can get back out. And these float bags will keep your boat on the surface where it's more likely to bounce downstream and find an eddy than wrap on a rock. Protect your investment with a pair of airbags. If I'm going on a longer trip or something that's going to take me a little ways from the road, I'll bring a lot of extra accessories just for safety. You know, a screwdriver is always helpful, a light in case you stay out on the river a little later than you thought, first aid kit a lighter, some money is always a good idea for hitching the shuttle, a cell phone will get you to help from any height mountaintop, a little bit of food, and some water. All these things will go into a dry bag, and if it's cold, you can always bring a hat, maybe some gloves, or a warm sweater, just in case you spend a little more time out there than you planned. Here's a little trick I learned on the overnights of California. Instead of having to carry all this, just wrap a roll of duct tape around your paddle, just enough so you'll have what you need for that trip. And then it's with you no matter where you are.